Since the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, Ukraine has had to deal with a number of different challenges. Chief among these is the arming of a new Ukrainian army, one that dwarfs the size of the pre-war professional army in manpower and equipment. While there is no shortage of motivated volunteers filling the ranks, trying to provide them with the necessary heavy armaments has proven to be a leviathan task. Fortunately for Ukraine, many nations have stepped in to help by providing a staggering variety of different equipment, from trucks to tanks, first aid to fighter jets, and rifles to rockets. This is on top of what Ukraine is bringing out of storage, designing and producing themselves, and with a little help from the Russian army, who has generously donated some of their own kit. In this video series, I will be taking a look at the motley assortment of heavy equipment that Ukraine has in service, where it all comes from, and what role it serves. This is going to be a general overview, not a comprehensive field guide or a recognition guide, if you are looking for something like that, I suggest you go to the YouTube channel What is Moo. He has an excellent series on Soviet heavy weapons and is working on his own Ukraine guide that will be more detailed than what I am attempting. In this first video, I will be taking a look at Ukraine's tank fleet. Tanks probably don't need much of an introduction historically. They have played a pivotal role in the battlefield since the First World War and continue to be designed and produced in many variations to this day. There are some misconceptions, however, about how tanks are generally utilized. More often than not, they are not firing at other tanks, but rather enemy infantry, fortifications, and light vehicles. Tanks also face a myriad of threats on the modern day battlefield, including aircraft, helicopters, anti-tank guided missiles, mines, artillery, close and anti-armor weapons like RPGs, and now the ever-present grenade-wielding drones. Despite all of these obstacles, the tank has persevered, and a number of different models can be found in Ukraine's tank battalions. The first and oldest entry on this list is the M55S. The M55S series started life as base models of the T-55, which was developed and fielded by the Soviet Army starting in the 1950s. Some of these vehicles were sold to Yugoslavia and served in the Yugoslav People's Army, or JNA. They then went to Slovenia, who gained independence from Yugoslavia in 1992. By this point in time, the T-55 was quite obsolete, lacking the protection, firepower, engine power, and electronics needed to compete with modern vehicles. To make these vehicles more competitive, the Slovene firm Stol Ravne teamed up with Israel's LB Systems to make a comprehensive upgrade package. This includes features like exchanging the old 100mm D10 gun for a NATO standard L7 105mm cannon with a thermal protection sleeve, the installation of ERA, or explosive reactive armor, along the front and flanks of the hull and turret, a digital ballistic computer and modern fire control system to allow the tank to fire accurately on the move, new day and night sights for the gunner and commander, a new more powerful engine, new suspension, and new road wheels. This upgrade package was applied to Slovenia's T-55s from 1997 to 1999. They remained in service until they were placed in storage in 2016, and this is where they stayed until September of 2022, when it was announced that Slovenia would provide 28 M55S tanks in exchange for 45 heavy trucks from Germany. They were delivered in October and were first seen in theater in the hands of the 47th Mechanized Brigade. Some photos and videos of Ukraine's M55Ss was published in early 2023, showing them training in tandem with Ukraine's recently received M2 Bradleys. The M55S likely saw its combat debut during the summer counteroffensive. As the 47th Mechanized Brigade was moved to the southern front directed at the Zaporizhia Oblast. I'm not able to find much data on the M55S's combat performance so far, though we do know there are already some losses. According to the Oryx database, two have been visually confirmed taken out of action, one destroyed and one damaged at the time of this recording. While the M55S may not be the ideal tank for the armed forces of Ukraine, it serves as a much needed stopgap. In order for Ukraine to properly compete with Russia in a longer war of attrition, it will need time to refurbish and upgrade its older stock of tanks, as well as receive other models old and new from its western partners. There is no further stock of M55Ss for Ukraine to draw from, except for two examples that Slovenia kept in their inventory. And while it is theoretically possible that T55s in deep storage across Ukraine could be refurbished and upgraded to the M55S standard or similar, I think it is very unlikely at this point. There are more modern vehicles in storage that are more common and easier to maintain. The M55S is not useless though. It still has a sizable gun and can be used in a similar fashion to other T-series tanks, just not quite as effectively. Hopefully they will be able to serve their purpose until modern vehicles are available in higher quantities. The second vehicle on our list is the T-62. The T-62 is the successor to the T-55 sharing some characteristics and components while offering some upgraded firepower in the form of a 115mm smoothbore gun. 
saw active service throughout the Cold War and was the primary tank deployed by the Soviets during the Soviet-Afghan War. Ukraine did not acquire any stockpile of these vehicles after gaining independence. The reason I bring up this tank at all is to go on a small tangent that I think is important to keep in mind when we address the topic of captured vehicles. The Russians have lost a lot of heavy equipment in this war. A lot. This includes a sizable number of vehicles that ended up abandoned and then recovered by the Ukrainians. This does not mean that every captured unit can be turned around and sent to the battlefield fully functional. Many of the estimates that I have seen believe that on average, one in every three pieces of heavy equipment that is captured can be brought back into fighting condition. The T-62 represents an extreme on this scale, where it is unlikely many, if any, of these tanks can be brought back up to scratch for a prolonged period of time. As of the time of this recording, Ukraine has captured 45 T-62s over the course of the full-scale invasion, but due to a lack of spare parts and the 115mm ammunition, their utility as tanks is limited. This does not make them completely useless, however. A heavy workshop in Ukraine was filmed removing the turrets from several captured T-62s and replacing them with a makeshift superstructure and engineering tools to convert the T-62s into armored recovery vehicles, or ARVs. This would allow the modified vehicles to help fill a vital role and keep other vehicles active on the front lines. Another workshop was also spotted modifying a T-62 this time swapping the standard tank turret for the turret of a BMP-2 infantry fighting vehicle that was also captured from the Russians. These two examples highlight how good application of creativity and mechanical know-how can help keep even the most rare vehicles in working condition, even if it wasn't for its original role. So while it is unlikely Ukraine will ever field any sizable unit of combat-ready T-62s, they still offer a decent amount of utility when properly modified. Before I talk about the next three tanks on our list individually, I feel I need to mention them together. To the casual observer, the T-64, T-72, and T-80 probably appear to be the same vehicle, and they're not totally wrong. These vehicles all share the same family of 125mm primary weapon, have similar armor configurations, and have very similar dimensions. The history of these vehicles and their developments could probably be a video all on its own, but for the sake of brevity and keeping a focus on the war in Ukraine, here is the quick rundown of the primary Soviet and post-Soviet MBTs before I talk about them individually. The T-64 was a revolutionary design when it was first pressed into service. The 125mm smoothbore gun was much larger than the 105mm cannons that NATO had been standardizing on, and it had a number of new and complex technologies, like its compact 5-cylinder diesel engine. With these new features came a long list of technical difficulties, however, Trying to keep the new fleet of tanks combat ready proved rather cumbersome at first. After several years of research and development, along with a heavy dose of political infighting, another tank plant got the go-ahead to start production on a simpler design, the T-72. This vehicle dispensed with some of the fancier parts of the T-64 while maintaining the same profile and firepower. It was significantly cheaper to manufacture and maintain, and rapidly became one of the most produced tanks of all time, around 25,000 units. The Soviet Union also exported the T-72 extensively, and it became the primary tank of most Warsaw Pact members for the later stages of the Cold War. In the meantime, another design bureau was working on a project that would combine features of both the T-64 and T-72, throw in a high fuel consumption gas turbine engine for good measure, and the T-80 was born. This series was the elite of the Soviet tank fleet, fast, quiet, and reliable, the main trade-off being its rather hefty price tag. All three of these tanks would remain in service with various countries after the fall of the Soviet Union, and now we will see how relevant each one is in the Russo-Ukrainian War. While Ukraine inherited all of these types after gaining independence, the mainstay of its tank force was the T-64. This is no small coincidence, the manufacturing plant that produced the whole series of T-64s was the Malyushev factory based in modern-day Kharkiv. This strong base of heavy industry allowed Ukraine to not only maintain its fleet of T-64 tanks, but develop and produce their own upgrades as well. Several projects were started in the 1990s, but due to nationwide financial problems, only a handful of tanks were upgraded during the 2000s and early 2010s. This all changed after Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, which sent a shockwave through Ukraine's military industry and gave great incentive to invest in many military projects, including upgrades for MBTs. The Military Balance 2021 estimates that Ukraine had around 700 T-64s in service and almost 600 in storage on the eve of Russia's full-scale invasion. 400 of these were the vintage T-64 BV, which had not been upgraded much, if at all, since the late 1980s. 
The other 300 were the upgraded variants T64BV Mod 2017 and T64BM Bulat. The Bulat program was introduced during the early 2010s and provided a series of upgrades for the older BVs, including Ukrainian developed Naj ERA, a new night sight, new transmission, and a more modern 1000 horsepower engine to replace the 700 horsepower Soviet era model. The 2017 modification of the T64BV offered some of the same features as the Bulat, like the Naj ERA, as well as further upgrades including new optics for the commander and gunner, new GPS, and new digital communications equipment. The remaining stock consisted of several other variants including old T64A and unupgraded B variants, and a couple dozen T64s that were being modified for export. All active variants of the T-64 fielded by Ukraine have seen extensive combat since full-scale hostilities began in February of 2022, and attrition has been heavy. According to the Oryx database, 353 T-64s of the Ukrainian armed forces have been visually confirmed lost as of the end of August 2023. There's been limited opportunity for replenishment, none of Ukraine's NATO allies possess any T-64s to deliver as aid, the only operator outside of Ukraine and Russia is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This does not seem to deter Ukraine from keeping up support for these vehicles. Many are still being upgraded when the opportunity presents itself. Ukraine's main military industrial concern, Yuko Baronprom, recently signed a deal with Vop CZ of the Czech Republic and Bumar Wabende of Poland for the refurbishment and upgrade of the many T-64s that still remain in deep storage. Most will require a full disassembly and overhaul, but in time these units can help replace the current casualties. Overall, despite the heavy losses and being supplanted as Ukraine's primary battle tank by the massive influx of T-72s from abroad, the T-64 will still play an important role on the battlefield for the foreseeable future. The T-72s that Ukraine would receive during the breakup of the Soviet Union were hardly state-of-the-art even for the time. This included an assortment of A and B models, the A's mostly unmodified since the 70s, and the B's not having received the latest 1989 upgrade package. Unlike the T-64, Ukraine's military industry developed a plethora of different upgrade packages for the T-72 throughout the 90s and 2000s, mostly with the intention of attracting customers abroad. I won't get into those modifications here, but if you're interested in obscure and weird vehicles, I would recommend taking a closer look. Some of these designs were more modest, while others were, um, let's just say unorthodox. After Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, and the ongoing combat with separatists in Donetsk and Luhansk, the Ukrainian military decided to upgrade some of its aging T-72A fleet to a better standard. The result of this project was the T-72AMT, which had all-around better protection for the crew, and some of the features of B-model T-72s, including the better gunner sight, and the ability to launch anti-tank guided missiles out of the main gun. On the eve of the full-scale invasion, Ukraine had about 130 T-72s in service and another 500 in storage. Not long after the invasion had commenced and it was established that Ukraine had the will to resist, Western nations began to consider different types of military aid, including tanks. Many NATO partners that had once been part of the Warsaw Pact had extensive stocks of Soviet-era main battle tanks, specifically T-72s. Delivery started as early as April of 2022 and came first from the Czech Republic and Poland. Bulgarian T-72s were also spotted, though due to domestic political issues, these units were likely purchased by a third party and then sent as aid. The T-72s that made their way into Ukrainian units in the spring and summer of 2022 were quite long in the tooth, the majority of them being the T-72M1. These models were designed specifically for export and had worse protection than the A models. The Poles had upgraded some of their M1s during the 2010s to the M1R standard, which included new optics, sights, GPS, and communications equipment. The Ukrainians were more than happy to take what they could get, however, and many were modified in the field by their crews, the most common addition being large amounts of Contact-1 explosive reactive armor blocks. As the war progressed, more vehicles were offered to Ukraine, including 31 T-72As from Macedonia in August and 20 T-72Bs from Morocco near the end of 2022. 2023 would bring even more pledges of T-72, including a new upgrade program that would take older M1s and As and overhaul them to a new EA standard. These tanks were refurbished and upgraded in the Czech Republic, and the program was paid for by the United States and the Netherlands with the goal of upgrading 90 tanks. 
The final main variant of the T-72 that Ukraine received as aid is the PT-91 Tavardi. This is a T-72M or A variant that underwent a massive overhaul in the late 90s. This included features like a new fire control system, sights with night vision and thermals, better engine and transmission, Polish-made explosive reactive armor, and a laser warning system. This system would tell the crew if they were getting targeted by a ranging laser, commonly seen on both vehicles and standalone anti-tank guided missile launchers. These were pledged in late 2022 and were first spotted in Ukrainian units in April of 2023. Poland claims it is sending 60 PT-91s, but they have been known to send some items to Ukraine discreetly, so the number could potentially be larger. The T-72 has also been generously provided en masse by the true crusader of the free world, Russia. In the year and a half since the war began, Ukrainian military units and civilians have been able to capture a staggering 315 T-72s of different types, including 104 of the T-72B3M variant, which was modernized as recently as 2016. Many of these vehicles were lost during the opening chaos and poor Russian logistics in the northern front near Kiev and Sumy, and in September during the Kharkiv counteroffensive. While I stated before that many captured vehicles cannot be fielded depending on their condition, this has not stopped the Ukrainians from trying to repair as many as possible. Pictures and videos taken show a multitude of Ukrainian tank units employing captured T-72s. One of the easiest ways to spot this is to see the Contact 5 and Relic to add-on armor, which Ukraine does not produce domestically. As the T-72 has become more active over time within the Ukrainian arsenal, its losses have also arisen. By the end of August 2023, Ukraine has been visually confirmed to have lost 172 T-72s of all variants. It will probably continue to be seen more widely in Ukrainian service, between the old and overhauled vehicles received as foreign aid, the ones refurbished and upgraded from domestic storage, and the ones handed over by the Russians whenever they feel charitable. There are still a lot more T-72s around than any of the other mainstay Soviet battle tanks, and whether through negotiation or sale, many more could potentially be acquired from nations across the world. Even more so than the T-64, the T-72 will remain a workhorse of the Ukrainian brigades for the duration of the war. Much like its predecessor, the T-80 fell out of favor in the years immediately following independence. Ukraine inherited several hundred units, including a number of more advanced T-80U and UD. 320 were sold to Pakistan in 1996, dramatically decreasing the size of Ukraine's operational T-80 fleet. Outside of special developments for the T-84, a successor to the T-80, the rest of Ukraine's vehicles in this category were removed from active service. The events of 2014 gave these vehicles a new lease on life. Ukraine needed all the armored vehicles it could get its hands on. By the end of the 2010s, several paratrooper units had received T-80 BVs out of storage. The T-84 also reached a new phase in development, culminating in the heavily upgraded BM Oplot. Features included a new welded turret, thermal imaging equipment for the gunner and commander, new fire control system, and a 1200 horsepower engine. The BM Oplot is also the first, and so far only Ukrainian tank to utilize the Duplet ERA and Varta Softkill Armor Protection System, which provide extensive protection against modern weapons like tandem charged warheads and laser guided missiles. Most of the BMO plots Ukraine produced were for an export order to Thailand, leaving them with two or three available on the eve of Russia's full-scale invasion, along with approximately five of the original T-84Us. These vehicles, combined with the T-80BVs, made for a rather small and eclectic bunch of tanks that were unlikely to have much of an impact compared to the rest of Ukraine's armored inventory. At the current stage of the war in late August 2023, little has changed. Ukraine has so far been visually confirmed to lose 49 T-80s, though it is difficult to know how many of these are from the pre-war inventory. Ironically, it seems fairly plausible that the quantity and quality of Ukraine's T-80 arsenal may have increased, at least temporarily, as they have captured at least 165 Russian T-80s. About half of these are the T-80U and T-80BVM, which are superior to many of the other tanks at the Ukrainian military's disposal. Some even gained notoriety in the field, including the captured T-80BVM Bunny, which was abandoned by the Russians in early March 2022, was recovered by Ukraine and served in the 93rd Mechanized Brigade until the vehicle's destruction outside of Bakhmut in April of 2023. It remains unclear how well the T-84 or the BM Oplot have performed since the start of the war. Various pictures and videos of the T-84U have been released, and in interviews the crews say that they like the tank compared to the previous Soviet-era models. 
70 units is not going to make a difference. However, there appears to be plans for new production in the future. Ukrainian Defense Secretary Alexei Reznikov stated in May of 2023 that Ukraine plans on reopening facilities to produce the BM Oplot. This may also be related to the announcement by the German industrial firm Rheinmetall that they were partnering with Yuko Baronprom to produce a tank repair facility on Ukrainian soil in order to better facilitate the recovery of Western supplied equipment. So while it remains unlikely that the T-80 will play a sizable role in the upcoming fighting, its successor might still fill the role of Ukraine's elite main battle tank. Moving on to Western produced vehicles, we have the German produced Leopard 1. The Leopard 1 started production of its first iteration in the 1960s. It was designed in a period of the Cold War where NATO believed that chemical warheads, such as the High Explosive Anti-Tank Round, or HEAT, rendered heavy armor irrelevant. Thus the Leopard 1 sacrificed armor for speed, relying on maneuverability to survive on the battlefield. As a result, its frontal armor can only effectively protect against heavy machine guns and light autocannon. The version that was pledged to Ukraine in February of 2023 is the last serial iteration known as the Leopard 1A5. These vehicles were last upgraded in the late 80s and early 90s and are fitted with a fire control system and optics similar to that of the first Leopard 2s. They are armed with the same 105mm cannon that I mentioned during the entry on the M55S. So far, Germany, Denmark, and the Netherlands have made a combined pledge of around 135 Leopard 1s to Ukraine, with deliveries first starting in late July. How these vehicles will fare in the coming battles is uncertain. Their firepower, electronics, and optics are adequate, but their protection leaves much to be desired. These tanks were built to fight a flexible defensive war in Germany, not a static trench war in the Donbass. In any case, Ukraine is still happy to receive what it can, and their tank commanders will undoubtedly look for a way to exploit the Leopard 1's strengths as best they can. Directly succeeding the Leopard 1 is the Leopard 2 series of tanks. These vehicles came into service with the West German Bundeswehr in 1979 and represented a new generation of NATO main battle tanks. Armor was more of a focus than it was with the Leopard 1s. All iterations of the Leopard 2 incorporated new composite armor, and firepower was increased with a 120mm smoothbore gun. To match the mobility of its competitors, the Leopard 2 was fitted with a 1500 horsepower diesel engine. Even after the end of the Cold War, the Leopard 2 was upgraded extensively both for domestic and foreign use, and continues to receive new upgrade packages today. Ukraine received its first pledges of the Leopard 2 in January of 2023 from a number of different countries that can be dubbed the Leopard Coalition. The total number of vehicles that have been publicly promised includes 21 Leopard 2A6s from Germany and Portugal, 10 Stridswagen 122s from Sweden, and 54 Leopard 2A4s from Poland, Canada, Norway, Spain, Denmark, and the Netherlands, making for a total of 85 Leopard 2s as of late August 2023. The 2A4 variants are of 90s vintage, but still possess capable communication systems, day-night sights, including thermal imaging and a digital fire control system. The 2A6 introduces some significant upgrades, including a longer 55 caliber gun with access to new types of ammunition, applique armor on the front and sides of the turret and hull, and modern electronics. The Stridswagen 122 is a Swedish upgrade of the Leopard 2A5, featuring heavily reinforced armor on the top of the turret and front of the hull, though it retains the shorter 44 caliber gun of the Leopard 2A4. Leopard 2s have seen heavy use since the start of the Ukrainian counteroffensive along the Zaporizhian front. As of late August, 16 Leopard 2s have been confirmed destroyed or damaged. There has been some controversy over the repair of the damaged machines. Poland and Germany were to have signed a deal allowing Ukrainian Leopard 2s to be repaired at Polish facilities, However, this has faced numerous delays due to political issues over who will absorb the cost of refurbishment. Since the initial pledges earlier in the year, no additional Leopard 2s have been pledged or sold to Ukraine publicly. The delivery of Leopard 2s was part of a major step forward for Western nations and their willingness to provide heavier equipment. This motion will not mean much if the current force of vehicles cannot be enhanced or even sustained. These tanks have a different crew complement to their Soviet-style counterparts, use different electronics, different guns, and have different maintenance requirements. The personnel that operate and maintain the Leopards require a very different knowledge set and training regimen compared to what most of the other tank units utilize. I'm sure at least some have trained on both platforms, but it would still cause further headaches to have to retrain tankers on multiple incompatible vehicles, on top of taxing an already heavily strained system of logistics. So while Ukraine trudges forward with its new kit, hopefully they can rely on their neighbors to maintain the supply of heavy metal. 
Though I will not discuss the AMX 10 RCs that were pledged by France in this video, as I don't really think they fit the definition of a tank, they were an important landmark in the supply of weapons to Ukraine, namely for the fact that this convinced the Brits that it would be better to upset the Russians than to let themselves be outdone by the French. And thus not long after the AMX 10s were pledged, the Challenger 2 became the first Western produced modern main battle tank to be promised to Ukraine. The Challenger 2 was developed near the end of the Cold War and was accepted into service by the British Army in the late 90s. It is unique amongst the NATO NBTs in that its 120mm main gun is rifled, not smoothbore like the Leopard 2 or Abrams. This means that ammunition for the Challenger 2 is not interchangeable with that of the other Western tanks being delivered to Ukraine. The Challenger 2 boasts effective protection in the form of Chobham armor. While its details are still classified, this armor has proven incredibly effective in the field. During the 2003 invasion of Iraq, there were multiple incidents where Challenger 2s were hit by a dozen or more anti-tank projectiles without their crews being injured, and some of these vehicles were even rated as combat ready within just 24 hours of being damaged. Ukraine received its pledge of Challenger 2s in January of 2023 and the crews were fully trained by late March, according to the British MOD. Since the first vehicles arrived, they have been seen training as part of Ukrainian air assault units alongside other Western-provided vehicles. Some have also been spotted equipped with modified minesweepers to clear obstacles Russia has set up along the so-called Surovikin line. The Challenger 2s of the Ukrainian armed forces have been in the field since around mid-August, where they were committed to the assault on the Zaporizhia axis as part of the 82nd Air Assault Brigade. So far, one has been visually confirmed destroyed. While I'm sure the remaining vehicles will serve a valuable role wherever they end up, their long-term prospects are lacking. Not only has the UK only sent a company's worth of tanks, but they also don't have that many more to send to begin with. Around 227 remain in service with the British Armed Forces, and none have been produced in over 20 years. Most of the vehicles currently in British inventory have been earmarked for the domestic Challenger 3 upgrade program, so it is unlikely that Ukraine will receive more Challenger 2s in any quantity. Last on our list is the third modern MBT that was pledged to Ukraine, the M1A1 Abrams. The Abrams began its development in the 1970s after the MBT-70 program, a cooperative effort between the United States and West Germany, fell apart due to massive overexpenditure. While Germany continued working on their Leopard series, America started to work on the XM1, which followed a similar design philosophy as its other NATO contemporaries, with the notable exception of being equipped with a gas turbine engine rather than a traditional diesel engine. The Abrams was also the first tank to enter full production with the British-designed Chobham armor. The M1 would see incremental upgrades through the close of the Cold War and beyond, with over 10,000 being produced so far. The vehicles that were initially pledged to Ukraine were the M1A2 configuration, however this was later changed to the M1A1. The stated reasons for the downgrading were that the M1A1s would be available sooner and that the M1A2 would take longer to train Ukrainian crews on. Another reason might also be that the United States is currently in the process of upscaling its export of M1A2s, with units being refurbished and delivered to Australia, Poland, Romania, and Taiwan. The US government stated recently that the batch of M1A1s has completed refurbishment and were being transported to Ukraine. It is not currently known what modifications were made to these Abrams or if they received any upgrades. If they are stock A1s, then they would still have good protection and good optics for both day and night operations, about on par with the Bradley IFBs that have been delivered already. All in all, the Abrams seems to possess the same general strengths and weaknesses of its other Western peers. They have access to modern optics and electronics and are generally safer for the crews than their Soviet counterparts, but have only surfaced in token numbers thus far. The United States has demonstrated that it retains the industrial capacity to continue manufacturing and upgrading Abrams, both for domestic use and foreign customers, however it remains unsure where Ukraine fits into the larger picture. There is great potential here for the Ukrainian tank force, but like other Western vehicles it is heavily dependent on the long-term commitment of its NATO benefactors. So what does all of this leave Ukraine with in terms of capability? At this stage of the war, the majority of its tank force consists of the same late Soviet era tanks that it started with, only now with an even more vast array of sub-variants. Western produced MBTs have provided the Ukrainian armed forces with some additional firepower and morale boost, however they have not appeared in adequate numbers to provide any sort of significant advantage. 
There have also been no additional pledges of Challenger 2, Leopard 2, or Abrams since January, making the sustainment of these vehicles a rather difficult task. There have been heavy casualties overall, with approximately 660 tanks visually confirmed lost by early October of 2023. But with the help of Western partners and the occasional generosity of the Russians, Ukraine has been able to sustain its active tank force throughout the war. Comparing the military balance 2021 and 2023 shows a marginal increase in combat-ready tanks, without accounting for Leopards, Challengers, Abrams, or the later pledges of Soviet-era MBTs. There's also the potential of increased production at home and abroad, as well as the refurbishing and upgrading of several hundred units of T-64 and T-72. Despite all the obstacles that a tank is likely to face on a modern battlefield, observation of footage and interviews with crews and commanders shows its role as a valuable tool within the greater system of combined arms warfare remains intact. Numerous drone videos have showcased small units of mobile infantry working in tandem with MBTs to suppress and eliminate Russian positions, with some tanks going so far as to run over trenches and fortifications. Modern communication systems, combined with the scouting capacity of these small and cheap drones, has had a significant impact on both individual vehicles and larger units' ability to respond rapidly to new developments on the battlefield and maintain cohesion between all the different elements of a combined arms force. So as Ukraine trudges forward with liberating its lost territory, it will continue to rely heavily on its mixed bag of MBTs to take some hits and dish them back out. And while this motley assortment of vehicles that could generously be described as a logistical nightmare is far from the best solution to Ukraine's problem, it serves as a testament to Ukraine's ability to take what it receives as aid, upgrades and produces themselves, and throws together from the Russians' leftovers into a coherent fighting force that routinely punches well above its weight in the nation's struggle for survival. Whew. All right. For those of you that are still here, thank you very much for sticking with it. I know uh, this material can be very dry and that my monotone voice does not help. I have recorded this video in chunks based off of a script that I wrote. It proved to be a bit more daunting and difficult than I initially thought it would be. I had to refine my process a couple of times to try and get it to something that I found personally acceptable uh, for this type of long form video. Be sure to let me know in the comments if you spot any errors. I'm sure there are at least several, probably more. I gathered all this research material through open sourcing, uh, all sorts of different databases, uh, especially some very helpful folks on different social media sites. Uh, there's the Oryx database, which I have mentioned several times in the video, which is responsible for probably one of the most comprehensive active databases of any sort of information in any war, I would assume, in our modern history. Uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, I would definitely recommend taking a look. It is very impressive. There's also others that have helped me out. Um, want to mention Red Effect, who gave me some suggestions for corrections on several of the different tank entries. Uh, thank you for providing feedback. And uh, I will mention as many people who helped with this project and provided source material as I can in the bibliography. Uh, if you see your material shown here, uh, but you are not mentioned, be sure to let me know and I will try to correct that as quickly as I can. Be sure to let me know what type of equipment you guys would want me to cover next. Um, to me, at least, the logical progression would be something like armored personnel carriers, APCs, or IFVs, infantry fighting vehicles, but um, I would be fine with trying to cover anything else. Uh, artillery systems, anti-aircraft systems, there's all sorts of different uh, categories of heavy equipment that could be covered. Uh, there's some items that might be difficult to categorize, like the AMX-10 that I mentioned earlier. Uh, like Perun said, if the AMX-10 is anything, it is French. So there's, there's plenty of content to keep going. If you guys would like to see me try a different form of video covering a different sort of topic, uh, be sure to let me know. There are some podcast ideas I've thought of uh, before regarding different historical topics. Uh, so yeah, be sure to shoot me some ideas. And just once more, thank you so much for watching and you guys all have a great rest of your day.